So the recording has started, it probably prompted you. That doesn't look right at all. <laughs> okay. Um. I'm guessing what's happening is, okay. Uh. Okay, here we go. Uh, except it's not the right. Why is it not sharing the right screen? <laughs> or is it? Are you seeing a first slide that's called um, Introduction to Transportation yep. Equity? Okay, great. Okay, cool. Um, so this is an introduction that we gave to the e-science um, back in November. Um, I will say that our hope is that eventually e-science will be a partner in running the TDEI after the system is launched. Um, so the motivation there was to just keep them up to date on what's happening with the project. Um, so I will give a 15 minute overview and then I'll make the, obviously the slide deck will be available to you later. And then we will do an architecture review with the remaining time. So first we'll talk about just motivations of why our project is needed out there. I mean, there's so many different actors out there that are providing transportation data in general. Um, and one of the best known transportation data specifications is GTFS. And GTFS came out of the need for fixed route services like bus services, uh, train services, things that run on a schedule and have fixed um, locations for pickups and drop-offs. Um, they needed to be able to publish their services in a standardized form so that um, essentially this was motivated by Google. They were interested in consuming these feeds and then being able to serve um, uh, travelers with that information. So the idea is to be able to provide discoverability of services as well as you know, digital consumption of these feeds at scale with you know uh, extensibility to different regions with the ability to provide apis for this kind of stuff um, at scale um, and so google was really pushing this specification and i should note that usdot was actually pushing other kinds of data standardization efforts at the same time and it turned out that um, google's working with trimet was more collectible and something that just took off much faster because there was both a production, like a, a group that was producing it, as well as a group, group that was consuming it. And so people just kind of like, oh, I want my feed too in the Google Directions app, right? Um, and so that's kind of what promoted this data spec. It's not even a data standard, as opposed to the data standard effort that USDOT was promoting. So moving right along, like, so there are all these other efforts out there um, to do, for example, um, curb management, right? Because cities gain 
um, gain by managing their curb more efficiently. Um, you can, you know, provide parking information to people if you know what's happening at the curb, if you know what the zoning is for that curb. You can imagine that there's other data for like shared mobility. So all these Ubers and Lyfts and, and micro mobility, they all provide feeds about their own data. And the question is, how do we standardize this stuff so that we can consume it also through Google, for example, and provide it to travelers? Um, so why is it that we're interested in just doing more of the same that others are doing? So, so I'm going to motivate this by saying that cities can be really complex to navigate. And just like um, Sam acknowledged earlier, technology helps many people get the information that they need, but there still are some gaps in terms of some of the environments that people travel through, as well as some of the services that are provided. So um, we do a lot of participatory design in our work at the lab. You'll see that uh, hopefully soon. Um, and so working with participants, we identified uh, like, a, for example, Kevin here told us that using tools like directions on Google Maps doesn't really help them get around because it could potentially do more harm than good, um, given that some of the information is not there and he sent down streets he can't cross or up inclines that are impossible to climb. And that can be really frustrating because, you know, we, we all try to use the same tools, but not all the same tools are good for the same people at the same time. Um, what this example goes to show is like, what are the current resources to bridge those gaps in knowledge? Uh, so when you go to the UW services office, now that you're so familiar with all their different <laughs> offices, um, if you asked for an accessibility map, you'll be provided a PDF like this. So this is our campus. It's a current accessibility resource. It has all kinds of complex and clutter cluttered demarcations about, you know, where are the paths? Um, it doesn't fully tell you what the amenities are. You'll have to consult the key to understand if this is accessible to you or not. There's clearly some differentiation here between the dotted lines and the straight lines. And then there's some version of a mix between the two. Um, it's only moderately accurate because it's only as accurate as when they published it, right? They can't, they don't really have a mechanism for updating and maintenance. And that's part of the data life cycle that we need to attend to. Um, and what's really important is that if you try to use it to actually identify what's good for you, you have to say, oh, okay, I'm going to park at W41. If I park there and I'm trying to get here, I need to evaluate each part of the path on its own and understand if that is the right way, for, like that makes sense for me and my abilities. And then I need, you know, uh, backup plans one, two, and three in case this uh, information is too old and I hit a snag along the route, I need to have some alternatives uh, prepared in advance. And the truth is, you know, this sounds onerous and it sounds like I'm making this up, but having talked to our participants, we did identify that people spend up to four hours like going through Google Street View to even plan a route for one trip that they're unfamiliar with. I mean, if they're already familiar with the environment, they probably don't do as much of an interrogation. And if they are planning to go with somebody who can help them out of a out of a, a snag, then they probably do less uh, interrogation. But in general, it's very unpleasant if you get stuck um, in the middle of the street in like a reroute for construction. And, and so people really are cautious about that. And um, what's, what's really upsetting is that people end up avoiding um, travel at all or by themselves if they've had these experiences because that's just a really unpleasant experience and then they're um, they remain sort of um, 
uh, external to community events and society and enjoying, you know, community living. And, and so, of course, we want to ameliorate some of that. So the first motivation behind the Transportation Data Equity Initiative is to acknowledge that behind every useful mobility app, there's like a complex data pipeline, and it's supposed to provide reliable and intuitive travel discovery and, and information about, you know, where to go. And it's acknowledged that public agencies and private companies need shared data and shared tools to represent all those travel environments and services. So right now we have several travel environments as well as several types of services that are gapped. They, they don't currently have those digital feeds like the GTFS feed. And so we want to bridge some of those gaps. Um, and so when you look at a trip itinerary app and you ask yourself, okay, what does it take to provide a trip itinerary with all these modes that are shown on this iPad screen, like bus and rideshare, metro, shuttle, light rail, clearly um, there are feeds that are being consumed here. And if you're gonna provide your trip itinerary at scale, then you want to be able to have sort of regional APIs to ping, um, so regionally non-specific APIs to ping to basically say, hey, I want all the GTFS feeds for this bounding box because I'm going to service this area. Just give me whatever you have as opposed to start finding all of the service providers that are currently out there. Like, oh, I happen to know that in Puget Sound, King County Metro and Sound Transit are the main uh, the main operators of, of transportation services. So I'm going to go to their website and find their endpoint of where they're provisioning the stream. And I'm going <laughs> to hard code that stream into my app because I'm now working on a Puget Sound specific application. Um, so... Currently, that's still what Google is essentially doing. They find these feeds and where these um, transit operators are doing are providing their feeds. They just provide an additional service to take those feeds, recompose them, and then provide a transit API that consumes those feeds on a regular basis from the specific endpoints, and they resell the data, essentially. Uh, but they only do this for the GTFS static feeds, right? For the bus trips and the metro, all those places that have, like we said, a fixed schedule and a fixed stop. Um, all these other kinds of services like shuttles. Uh, so I'm wondering why this says shuttle because there isn't really currently a good format for shuttles, or at least it's not uh, often shared by transit agencies. That's part of the aspect that we're working on. As you can see here, it's also missing any kind of information about the transit station or pedestrian space itself in terms of like what it would uh, offer. Okay, so so this image is trying to capture what are the current gaps in terms of efforts to standardize and collect this information at scale. So as we talked about at the top of this, um, so we're, let me start from the middle. <laughs> we're really traveler focused. If we're trying to change transportation instead of focusing on how many cars we've moved through, but rather really focus on travelers and their perspective on the system, we want to be traveler focused. And there are like a ton of different uh, models out there about how to become traveler centric. You might hear words like MOS, which is mobility as a service. You might hear words like MOD, which is mobility on demand. You might hear words like smart city, which is also sort of an idea of being able to uh, either using internet of things or different kinds of sensing techniques to really understand where are the travelers, focus on them, and then provide them with digital services to discover where the travel services are. So that discoverability, but also access it using a single 
endpoint, like a, an Uber app kind of thing. So if we're going to be traveler centric and we have this digital ring around the travelers that enables them to access information readily in one endpoint, be, and, and some are even really focused on having the same payment um, uh, location so that you don't have to pay for like three different services and three different apps. Um, then we need to have the data readily available for all those different services that are out there to be able to reach the, the traveler via like applications or other kinds of real-time management of that information. Um, so what are some of the data that are currently provided at scale? What are some efforts that are currently ongoing but are not ongoing with us? And what are our efforts? So starting up again from the GTFS fixed route feeds, this we already talked about. This is anything that has a fixed schedule and a fixed um, location for pickup and drop off. This is already fed into this digital ring system that reaches the travelers. Similarly, there's the road network, which um, is often consumed from OpenStreetMap as well as TomToms is a really common one to use for app developers. Um, you can also use Google Transit APIs. You basically are asking, what are the road network here? What is a routing graph for automobiles here? And so these two are readily shared all over the place. And this is what you get when you basically access Google um, directions, Apple directions, you know, all, Bing, all of those. They consume this. Now there is a lot of effort out there to provide fleet and rideshare information. Obviously, Uber and Lyft have their own feeds, but they don't really share that data because that's what they consider to be <laughs> their, you know, their proprietary information that they don't want to uh, provide to others so that others can't analyze how their algorithms um, sort of split the, the um, resources. Um, Micromobility also has feeds. There's a lot of effort out there to standardize all of these, particularly by municipalities who want to say, look, if you're going to provide your services in our city, you have to share your data so that we know where people are. How are the travelers actually using this, these services? Is it efficient? Are there travelers that are being excluded? Like all these questions come up for municipalities and they want this kind of data. So there's there's a lot of effort right now in terms of like, what's going to be shared? How are they going to share it? I'm going to leave that aside. We don't care about this very much, but we are aware that it's happening and we want to be able to interoperate with that. This is the part that we believe are, is currently left unturned, <laughs> particularly because there's no commercial interest behind it. So there's not very much commercial interest in terms of explaining what the bus stop looks like or what does the train station look like in terms of accessibility for different travelers. There's not a whole lot of information about the pedestrian infrastructure, even though some cities are monetizing that in a sense because like delivery robots are using that resource, right? So it would make sense to really pay attention to what's happening in the pedestrian infrastructure, really map it out digitally to understand where is it, where are things accessible, where are they not, where are people actually able to use the infrastructure to access public transportation. Of course, this ties into a lot of the different um, motivations that smart cities out there are interested in becoming more sustainable, more accessible. Um, more easy to engage with for all ages. Um, so even though there are lots of interest in this and there are lots of causes that this would kind of satisfy, there isn't one commercial entity that's willing to take this up, you know, and say, oh yeah, we can we can do the Google Street View for the for all pedestrian spaces, basically, something like that. Um, so that's not happened. And lastly, paratransit, community transit, all these services that don't have fixed schedules or fixed locations are out there. Can you guess how much of Washington State's uh, sort of public transit vehicle miles traveled per year? 
are occupying these kinds of services as opposed to the fixed route services. And let's just say fixed route services in Washington state include ferries, they include trains, and they include buses. Just, just throw out a number. What do you think? 10%. 10% from Sam. Uh, what are the some examples of the other kind? Yeah, so so one is uh, paratransit services, like I have a disability and I'm unable to use the fixed bus system, or can you at least pick me up from home and get me to the train or something like that? Okay. Another is um, shuttles, so like UW shuttle, chill, mm -hmm. you know, Seattle Children's Shuttle, employee type shuttles, so um, Microsoft Connector bus, <laughs> things like that. Um, another example would be community transit. So anything that happens on uh, First Nations reservations and um, traveling in rural areas also. So most rural area travel is not a fixed route because the buses don't just go there with fixed system. People typically flag down the service or, or something of that nature. Okay. So... If you think about the geography of Washington State, um, there is quite a bit of area where people are living not very in not very dense kind of settings, and so they would be served by these types of services. Okay. What's your guess, Rati? Uh, the rural area makes me think it's higher than ten percent because there's a lot of rural area in Washington, so maybe like twenty five percent. Okay, Sam, do you want to revise your number? <laughs> yeah, I did not think about the the shuttles and the isolated communities. Um, yeah, okay, I'm I'm gonna then in that case I'm gonna go higher. I will do thirty five percent. Oh, hey, okay, it's thirty four. As far as we the last data we have is actually for um twenty nineteen before the pandemic. We actually know for sure, I just had a conversation with King County Metro Access about how um, even though most of the fixed route services are back to about 85% from pre-pandemic, um, the uh, non-fixed route, the, the on-demand services are a lot lower than that. And they're kind of concerned, worried about like, what are people actually doing? Are, is their travel being satisfied or are they not? So um, this is actually a study that they're considering doing with us, but moving right along. <laughs> so, so these are kind of the unturned areas because there's not really a whole lot of commercial interest to, to look at these um, uh, areas and yet they serve so many of the population. Uh, so we should care about it, but often this is like subsidized. Um, this is often subsidized and these um, kind of are about infrastructure and operating, um, but it really does impact a lot of travelers. Okay, so our focus is travel environments and services. And we are looking at three different types of data, um, like Sam had noted. So Open Sidewalks addresses the digitization of information about sidewalks and pedestrian paths. GTFS Flex concerns the digitization of, um, of flexible on-demand types of services. And GTFS Pathways is addressing the digitization of a uh, representation of, of uh, mostly indoor, but it doesn't have to be indoor, but transit spaces. So bus stop, train stops, things like that, train stations, et cetera. And obviously um, that is a huge gamut of complexity, right? You can go anywhere from like a bus stop with a pole <laughs> to a multi-level um, large train station. And all of that needs to be represented by, by the pathways. Cool. So what is um, our, the motivation for planners to look at this favorably, right? Because we've been really focused so far on the traveler and the, the traveler endpoint to be able to consume this information. But is there any utility for the producers of this data so that we can motivate them to participate? 
So um, I wanted to note that this is, uh, this is from 2020, the American Society of Landscape Architects uh, publishes this annual um, sort of uh, information guide to architects about how to measure walkability. And I, I think you know that there's a lot of efforts out there to talk about green cities, about walkable cities, about sustainable cities, about, you might've heard the term 15 minute city, which is an effort to ensure that wherever you live, you have most of the amenities within a 15 minute walk of you. Of course, using those terms is quite complex because we don't all walk at the same rate. Not everything is accessible to all of us. And so right now when they define a 15 minute city, they're really just talking about what's within your radius. So it's really just basically drawing this imaginary dome around the centered location and saying, is that within you know a mile and a half of where you are or something like that? Um, but the actual network data that we're proposing will give a lot more definition and granularity of information to these kinds of concepts. So right now, if you say 15 minute city, you really just mean like what's within the one and a half mile radius of X. But really what we want to ask is, is the infrastructure really there to support all people to reach those destinations within a mile and a half. Um, and so having the kind of network that we're proposing to collect about sidewalks in this case, but of course we're offering similar um, routable graphs for those other two data specifications as well, would give you that kind of feasibility where you really are focused on connectivity. Like who is able to reach these things that we value like uh, parks or schools or health facilities or fresh food sources, you know? Um, so we asked a really simple question here, for example, if I am using a wheelchair or I have a stroller and I don't wanna jump curbs, where are there accessibility islands in the city of Seattle? So we have enough information about the full network to be able to see that actually there are two main sort of chunks of Seattle that are connected. That's the darker gray and the lighter gray. Those are connected networks. So there's a full way for you if with curbs to reach these destinations and they're tied together which is actually pretty remarkable. Uh, but then we found about 170 additional like tiny islands where if you're dropped off there with a wheelchair, forget it, right? Like you're not gonna get off. So you have like a one block area here and another block area here. And if you think that this is just kind of like an esoteric kind of um, uh, example, um, I will say we had one person who was actually working for our project uh, who uses a wheelchair and I got a call on Saturday night. Um, this researcher just went out at like 6 p.m. to the bars in Fremont um, to enjoy, you know, a, a typical what a graduate student does <laughs> on a Saturday night. And she got stuck because um, the access bus that she had reserved didn't show up. She waited for two hours. Then she called like yellow cabs has supposedly 40 accessible um, cab services that are available um, to her. Um, they were really rude, didn't give her a time and then eventually hung up on her. And she was stuck on one of these islands, so she couldn't even reach one of the scheduled bus routes to get out of like downtown the downtown area she was in to to go down. She lives by SeaTac, so it's a real issue. <laughs> and these accessibility islands uh, need to be understood so that the city knows how to apply their resources to address these concerns. You know. Um, I was happy that I have a lift van and I, I went and I picked her up and I was happy that I could do that. Um, so just 
to note that um, a lot of ha having this network type of information gives you a lot more and better understanding about where to put resources and how to prioritize them as well, right? Because you can look at these islands and say, oh, you know, this is by Leshai, so maybe there are not that many people traveling there, but oh, this is like Fremont area, right? Where there's a lot of amenities, a lot of services there. We probably want to address this. It's a big issue. So having that kind of granular understanding is important. Um, and having that data can also give you additional feasible kinds of interrogations and asking questions and analytics that you don't typically have access to. For example, um, Sammamish 2025 plan publishes this and they say, oh yeah, by 2025, these will be our service areas. And this is kind of the time that people can expect to have interval between the bus showing up. So I think this is 10 minute service, 15 minute service, 20 minutes and 25 or something like that. As you can see, you end up um, servicing some of the lake as part of your service because you don't have actual network information, right? So they're just like totally projecting in a very um, non-specific way who might be able to expect to have like 25 minute service type of service, but it's it's not really helpful if I'm both a user as well as the planner who's who's going to say, oh, so how many people are we actually servicing at 10 minutes, at 15 minutes, et cetera. But using open sidewalks and flex together, we can have like a clear data-driven infrastructure decision where we say, okay, if in down, if I'm plopped down downtown at, uh, for example, if I'm asked to be dropped off at Pioneer Square and none of the buildings are currently available down there to traverse in between streets using the indoor elevators, um, what is my area of reach sort of within five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, et cetera? Um, and you see that it's pretty small compared to when I do have access to these indoor elevators to expand my reach, basically. And of course, in this case, fixing this um, would mean you know, raising the mountain, which we're not going to do because the, the issue <laughs> is really topological here, that this is the area that is by the pier. So it's low and this is first hill. So going up this way, it's it gets really, really steep. And so the indoor elevators are what bridges people from like third street to fourth street. And then you don't have to go up a, a sidewalk that's 13 percent um, grade. Um, so one way to, uh, sort of apply resources here is this graphic is telling us that, you know, on weekends and nights, maybe we should pay building owners to allow people with disabilities to traverse those spaces, even though, you know, they're closed to the rest of the public or something like that to improve access. Um, and actually, that's what Seattle did. They put together a commission to work with building owners to improve access for people with disabilities. And, and this, this very image was actually used to kind of advocate and show them, you know, this is the data, how, how limited one's reach might be in the case when those elevators are not accessible. Um, so what I'm saying is having granular kind of information can really help with advocacy and specific information about where are people accessing and where are they unable to access. Um, one other thing that I wanted to note is that building the network data in the um, detailed objective way that we're proposing means that you can interpret it for different types of travelers, right? So we're not building data just for people with mobility limitations, or we're not building data just for people with vision disabilities, which is really what has happened, as, at least in research in the past you know, efforts, where there would be maybe a student, effort, a student, let's say a student thesis focusing on building an accessible travel app. And they would go and collect 
exactly the data they thought they needed to present to their target audience um, in a particular campus or location in a very limited scope. Um, and it was only interpretable in the way that they had intended for it to be interpreted, right? So, so to give an example, um, and I'm watching the time here, so I'll, I'll start moving a little bit faster. <laughs> but um, what we found is that, uh, you know, an example is, you know, mobility limitations. So you go and you survey se several participants and they'll tell you, I really care about inclines. I really care about curb ramps. I really care about surface disturbances, like gaps in the sidewalk and things like that. Please tell me about that. So they go and collect that data. It may be a routable graph. We've only seen three such examples before what we've done. Um, but a lot of times they just collect it spatially. They don't necessarily have it open and shared. And then it's available for that campus or wherever it is, um, but it's not networked. And then you can't take the same data and reinterpret it for somebody with vision disabilities, for example, because you don't have those attributes. Whereas what we're trying to build is something that can scale into that you know, more generalizable in, interpretable in different types of situations. And so what I'm demonstrating here is that the same data that we've been collecting was then you know, repurposed for a more um, blind and visually uh, disabled um, uh, population where here we're looking at still looking at raised curbs because we have that data, but also asking questions of the data about is there tactile paving? Um, if you it really have a landmark preference, meaning you can identify, you know, light posts and benches to orient you to where you are, that's helpful. Uh, avoiding stairs and also what is your preference for having a really controlled intersection, right? So that the light is there, it's chirping, ready for you to cross and indicates that this is a good time to cross versus like a yield sign, which is a lot more, um, it, it's a lot less controlled for someone who has no vision and can't necessarily identify when a car is about to cross. And I saw Rati having a question. Uh, yeah, so what is the percentage for on that scale? So ah, yeah, so, so what I'm not addressing here, um, which is a really big question for us, is the human factors. And thank you for asking that, right? So um, in all of this, a lot of these uh, attributes that or preferences that we're asking people for are not really super well defined in the sense that even when Access Map asks you, what is your maximum uphill incline? Very few people, I mean, people with disabilities often are aware of what their maximum is or what they're willing to take, you know, especially because ADA defines 5% and 8% as like these demarcations. So you might know your specific preference um, along that line. But a lot of times, you know, these preferences or needs are a, a little bit more subjective. Um, so uh, the percentage here is is something that we we need to really work with participants to improve these sliders to communicate much better what we're trying to gather from the audience, which is, you know, how much do you need landmarks in order to orient yourself to the path so that you know, for example, that I'm go oh I'm going around this circle and I expect to see one two three four five light posts until I get to the um, to the intersection I need to exit this round, right? Whereas on the other hand, going this way, you don't have those light posts. So um, you're just kind of, you need to figure out where you are at any given time in order to exit at the same uh, intersection of the path. So um, it's, it, it is subjective and we need to figure out how to represent this well for the, for the UI, for sure. <laughs> and, and I appreciate you noting that. Um, so that is still a research question, but we can certainly say that people have a preference for landmarks. They just, we need to kind of work with our audience to identify how to communicate that preference. 
Okay, so the second motivation is that we really need reliable, objective, detailed, consistent, and standardized shared data and tools. And I know that's a mouthful, but um, the, the whole point here is that if we collect it in this objective, detailed way, we can reinterpret it for different populations. We don't have to go back and recollect the data, and we can enable sort of a neutral data analysis to better understand any barriers that exist in the infrastructure, but also be able to improve data-driven resource allocation. So there's a lot here to unpack, and hopefully the previous slides kind of <laughs> noted the different aspects of this, but at the baseline, we really promote this no subjective labeling, which we see a lot of, like a lot happening. Like if you ever log into Google, um, not Google Crowd, Google, I apologize, I forget what they call like their crowdsourcing efforts. It's like Google communities for mapping. They ask people to annotate places of interest and they ask people to annotate all kinds of information um, and of course they gain points by annotating more and more but then first Google doesn't share all this data that it <laughs> uses the crowds for the other part is that they uh, are really promoting people to make these very subjective assessments about an accessible bathroom for example but accessible to whom is there any training? You know, are, are, are you expected to have any lived experience of what makes an accessible bathroom in order to say that it's accessible? You know, like all these concerns about like who's empowered to make these labels um, and, and who are we talking about when we talk about accessibility? So we're trying to avoid any of these by making really clear objective statements like how tall is the paper towel dispenser? You know, like that's that's a, a, an objective kind of question. Um, and of course, we don't collect um, bathroom information, but I just wanted to give an example of what that would be like. So, so what's imperative for our data pipeline infrastructure? Um, this is again facing some people who are not necessarily um, data scientists. So I did put this in here. Um, to describe like the full sort of data life cycle that data might live through. Um, and we need to fully support these different set of actions uh, that go from like raw data collection. And of course, you know, there's a lot of denoising and cleaning there um, through vetting, validation and refinement. So that's another part of the data life cycle, which we intend to support. And then um, storing and maintaining it, right? So maintenance is really important. Can I call this, call up my last release of the open sidewalks data and edit it so that people can continue and keep it updated? Um, you'd be surprised how many agencies, like savvy DOTs collect these sidewalk information like once because they got some liability lawsuit against them they spend all this money on the effort, but they don't pay attention to, it. it's then sitting in some assets management database. So it's not really editable in an easy way. You can't recall it back in, in a map. You can't edit the map, you know, like all that stuff is just stuck there and nobody updates it because it's really difficult to do. So we want to support infrastructure that enables people to maintain up-to-date information. Um, and we want to enable queries and analytics that allow people to really use the data, because if you don't use it, there's no point in maintaining it and vice versa. If, if you don't maintain it, there's no users will use it. So it's kind of a feedback loop that we want to support. Um, and then finally, we want to deliver the data consistently and understandably via APIs. So Again, I know both of you are really well aware of the data lifecycle, but in essence, the TDI system needs to be able to support all of these things in order for um, transit agencies and municipalities to actually use our system on, in a consistent way. 
So what is our project's goals? Now I gave you all this motivation. What are we actually trying to do? So the project is designed to create, modify, and improve data standards, right? So first we have these like specifications that are out there. I should actually change this to say specifications. I apologize. We are not, we are not yet decided if we're going to push open sidewalks in a standardization process because that's a big to-do. Um, so first we're working with different data specification groups, work groups to solidify what is a release of all of these um, and really being accessibility forward in this in, in these efforts, right? Because there are other people that are pushing flex and pathways, but they're not necessarily accessibility first um, as far as their efforts. Um, then we wanna publish and maintain the interoperable data infrastructure. So here I'm just mentioning some of the toolings that we are um, providing through the system, the data collection, the data vetting and validation, um, as well as the dissemination like APIs. But of course, embedded in this is storage and maintenance and editing and all that stuff. And then lastly, deploying and sustaining three demonstration applications. So this is just like, are they using the infrastructure? Can we demonstrate that someone is actually going to use this stuff? Um, otherwise, we didn't do our job. So um, really, the focus is on here, right? Because that's the biggest build uh, focus. Um, working with the working groups is a whole other kit and caboodle. I'm happy to talk about any <laughs> other time. And I'm happy for you guys to um, come into meetings, to share, to, you know, but that's really kind of an aside to, to what you might want to focus on. Um, and then like our team together is going to be focusing on the, the system and its uses basically. Uh, based on our application, uh, we, we have good relationships with three different state DOTs. So we focused on two counties in each one of these states. So this is when we when you hear us talk about the pilot areas, these are these six counties. It's King and Snohomish in Washington State, uh, Multnomah and Columbia in Oregon, and Hartford and Baltimore counties in Maryland. And so repeating our scope of work, we want to support the development and adoption of these standardized interoperable data. We want to engage stakeholders and partners on like the co-design of these data specifications, the API formats, and also best practices. And then we want to improve mobility data for travelers um, in the form of these data specs. And we have three demonstration projects that we're gonna um, be working on. And the one that's highlighted as Soundscape um, is because Soundscape was recently sunset by Microsoft. So we need to, to figure out, we're working with a Soundscape consortium to identify a path forward, but uh, we may need to find a, a third demonstration project. And um, the questions that we're constantly asking ourselves is are we adequately building for changing data standard specifications? So data specifications can always change. And then are we building our system so that it can accommodate changes? Like somebody is now working with release 1.4. Is it backward compatible? Things like that. Um, are we building for producers to actually contribute data? Like, are we so focused on travelers that we forgot that we really need the DOTs and the municipalities and the and the transit agencies out there to contribute this data on an ongoing basis and work with us? Um, are we building to allow contributors to improve the data richness and the density in their own jurisdictions, like whatever areas they're working on? Um, are we architecting non-region specific and scalable deployments? And then by providing APIs for downstream applications, will developers be able to consume our API? Um, and uh, you know, how, what does this look like post phase two? Like how do we sustain this effort for five years in phase three? 
So these are kind of internal facing questions, which is why it's great that you guys are um, are here because it's it, it's kind of the the questions we're constantly needing to to remind ourselves of so that we build for sustainability and translation downstream. And that is it. And I finished right on time, but I didn't much leave you much time for questions. <laughs> so let's have some questions and I think I'll be fine. As long as you guys are okay, I don't want to take you out of your day. Um, one question that I have is um, about, I guess, I'm not sure the technical term, but data ownership. So we have all these data sources that are going to go through our data pipeline. We are going to validate. And then we're gonna somehow expose this data through our APIs post-processing. Um, at what point, at what stage are we responsible for hosting the data? And at what stage is the uh, different contributors gonna be responsible for hosting the data? Um, I imagine data like this will be in, at, over time in terabytes, and maintaining it is gonna, basically, is it gonna be on premise for these agencies and contributors or is it gonna be centralized in the TDI project? The uh, intent is to centralize it in the project in a cloud setting where the tenants, you know, buy their share of storage, right? So. The, the focus really is on facilitating the process to the point where it's really attractive for them to participate with data collection but not and releasing, but not really worry so much about everything else, <laughs> which includes the capital requirement, the, the capital resource requirement of like keeping their servers. You know, this is what people are struggling with so much, especially in the flex arena you know all these shuttle services can you imagine do you know who's who's providing community shuttle services it's like a lot of times people who are seniors and um are no longer are retired interested in doing something good for their communities you know they're not going to do your data collection they're not going to set up it infrastructure to like provide data streams <laughs> of all this stuff right like so so the hope is that they're able to identify funding sufficient for them to participate in the participate in the um in the tdi and pay their fair share but not you know we're not going to gouge them <laughs> <laughs> basically is the answer if that makes sense uh also i think it's important to note that a lot of the stakeholders who are interested in sidewalks data are also these like you know poor cousins of 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 these kinds of community services because typically sidewalks are owned by the municipality a lot of municipalities don't have uh a lot of money and they put all of their money into their roads so they really don't have much um to be said for in pedestrian or bike infrastructure so so we struggle with the same issues that like bike infrastructure pr proponents are struggling with and in fact just last week i uh, participated in a um, symposium for bike network infrastructure and how to map that and who are the stakeholders and why we should do this in an open shared data repository as well because um, it's a similar type of struggle like nobody owns it nobody wants to maintain it but we all want that information Uh, I have a question about the GTFS standard. So how prevalent is it? Is it like a worldwide standard? Yeah. So GTFS uh, for fixed route is pretty much everywhere. And you can see... Um, the 
there are many places that keep a um, basically an endpoint list. Um, so mobility data is one of our partners. Where is your dataverse? I would expect to see a link to your dataverse. Where is it? <laughs> oh, this is not that useful. Um, this will just lead me to the um, to the description of the data spec. What I want is where's the um okay I'm gonna go I I'm surprised I didn't find transit land So this is kept by community. Um, and you can operator source feeds. So you can, oh, sorry about that. You can um, see We part. can't see your screen. I'm still seeing oh. the slide from before. Oh, gosh. Oh, sorry. OK. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for letting me know. <laughs> OK. So. Um, you can so Transitland has their own uh, place where they put all the feeds they know about, but it's basically a list of these different transit feeds. So you get from Italy and Canada and Spain. And if you happen to know who's the operator, like I said before, if I want to go Puget Sound, I can't just say Puget Sound because I don't have a search by area um i they there just happens to be a particular service called puget sound express <laughs> i don't even know um what kind of feed they provide but i guess i can access it via this url <laughs> but essentially like this is helpful but it's not an api i can't, it's not it's not a programmatically pingable uh, looks like this operates in Port, Port Angeles, which is a beautiful place. <laughs> Great. <laughs> uh, anyway, the, the point is that um, I did see um, that the repository here with GTFS specification for mobility data said something about APIs, but I'm actually not sure. Oh, you can create an API. So again, you can provide, they give you the resources to say, oh, okay, I can have a transit feed. Um, I can have a URL for it, but I can also create a REST API that somebody can get and post um, potentially queries to that. Uh, but it's still gonna be up to the transit provider to provide that API, right? Sam, you look a little quizzical. Does that answer? <laughs> Was there a question? Yeah, no, it, it, I'm just uh, looking at the website as well. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, um, any other questions? Are you still jazzed about the project? <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> it would be bad if this one turned you off, but yeah. <laughs> Are you no. breathing? Give her some feedback. <laughs> it was no, it's great. I'm even more excited. The more I know about the project, the more excited I get. Um, but yeah, this is not really a question, but knowing the reality of like the systems we exist in, I'm curious how we can get like a more buy-in from commercial entities and you mentioned deliveries and robotics and even like human delivery drivers and how that data one day can probably benefit them and 
just curious if uh, at some point they will do a little bit. Right. But, you know. uh, so in good times, like two years ago, when times were financially good, we were getting a lot of interest, both from Google and Microsoft. Uh, I mean, they are both partners on this project. Only both of them have kind of pulled their support for those programs internally because of the recent downturn, also because of their refocusing on chat GPTs. <laughs> like all of this is kind of um, a certain tide that we have to ride, I think. Mm -hmm. um, the question about delivery robots, I always think it's through policy. Like to me, I I've been advocating whenever I have a chance to speak to legislators to remind them that the infrastructure that they're allowing these companies to use is has commercial value right like it's just like allowing someone to use your um your water infrastructure or electricity you know it's 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 a commodity it's part of the commodity that we have as as our um community infrastructure and so when they just give people the right to operate on the sidewalks, they should at least ask for that data back because all of these delivery robots are collecting imagery that would be super helpful in the context of like maintaining data about the infrastructure. Um, so I have these conversations whenever I can. Um, I've been getting more and more access to legislature recently, which is good. Um, but at the same time, like we're busy building stuff. <laughs> so uh, if we had a full-time like lobbyist, that would be awesome. But. <laughs>